Good morning. Happy Father's Day. I am Kevin Lamar Jones, and I am so thrilled to be here. I just hope my shoes are heavy enough to keep me planted on the ground because I might just float away, and I am thrilled. I want to uh, introduce myself just briefly. Um, I am uh, rel a relatively newcomer to, to the chapel, and my wife and I have been blessed with just some wonderful children. But you can't have uh, Father's Day without a mother being in there somewhere. And I just want to give a shout out to Primula. And she's been a blessing to me. If the Lord allows us to see August 11th of this year, we will have been married for 30 years, which is very difficult to imagine. But she is literally that straw that stirs our family drink. As I mentioned, we've been blessed with six amazing children. You know some of them, certainly one, maybe better than the others. We've been blessed with two wonderful grand, uh, with two wonderful daughters-in-law. We call them daughters in love. And then we've been blessed with two amazing granddaughters. So if you look in the dictionary under blessing, you would see us. We are the definition of being blessed. When Chase mentioned to me uh, a few weeks ago, he was thinking about having a few members of the launch team uh, share uh, a few messages regarding this series. I said, uh, well, Chase, what are you thinking about? Um, uh, what, what's the topic going to be? And he said, the goat. I said, the goat? I got this. I'm, you know, I'm your guy. He said, well, not so fast, Dad. I'll, I'll think about it, but not so fast. I said, well, you know, I, I think I can handle it. He said, well, what are your qualifications? I said, well, we used to take you to the, to, uh, the petting zoo, and you would pet goats. And I said, we even signed you up for 4-H, and we took you down to the, to the Ohio State Fair. And then I said, I think I have a pretty, pretty cool goatee. So I think I'm qualified for, for this. He said, eh, not so fast, Dad. He said, I've got one other question for you, and if you can answer this, you're in. If, you're, if you miss it, you're out. I said, wow, okay. Give me, fire away. He said, what do you call a goat with one ear? I said, I got this. A van goat, silly. And so after that, he says, gee, Dad, you really are qualified for this. And so after that, we were good and that's how I arrive here this morning. Last um, week, Chase opened up this series, The Goat. The Goat being the greatest of all time. It's an amazing series of declarations that Jesus makes in the book of uh, in the Gospel of John. And as I mentioned last week, Chase began the series. He had the dubious task of not only introducing the series, but also uh, introducing or discussing the very first one of the I Am's, the I Am, the Bread of Life. I get the blessing of being able to share and unpack the light of the world this week, and then there'll be several others to follow. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the vine, the true vine. And then there'll be a couple of declarations that will wrap up the series. So please uh, turn to your uh, Bible, if you would, to um, John's Gospel, chapter 8. And we're going to look at verses 12 through 30. It's quite a few, but I'm going to read them all. I think it'll be helpful. And as I read through them and as we unpack this, you'll see the, uh, the power in all of these verses. So as you're turning there, just once again, I want to thank uh, Chase for entrusting me with this, this morning's message. I also want to give a, 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 thank, uh, a thank you and a blessing to, to the Chapel family just for welcome, welcoming us in, making us feel uh, part of your family, making uh, Chase and Amanda and Ada very, very uh, comfortable in their transition back here. So we're just uh, very, very thankful. With that, let's go to work. 
John 8, starting at verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is, is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, Therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. But no one arrested him, because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself, since he says, where I am going, you cannot come? He said to them, you are from below, I am from above, you are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you will believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. A short prayer. Father, your hymnist writes, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Lord, teach us how to pray. Father, would you open blind eyes this morning as only you're capable of doing? Would you give us illumination where we need it? And I ask this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus declares, he makes this startling declaration that he is the light of the world. But what is light? The first thing I think we need to establish is a pretty good working definition. And a good working definition is simply something that makes vision possible. Light is simply something that makes vision possible. If you Google it, there's more than 270 verses in Scripture that reference light. Light is essential to life. I, so I wish I could um, understand all the elements of what life is or what light is relative to life. I remember being in school and they throwing this uh, big uh, $7 word on us, photosynthesis, and how plants use sunlight to grow and prosper. Photosynthesis, what is that? And I never could quite grasp how a plant could gather nutrients and, and grow as a result of being in the light, being in the sun. I don't understand it, but I know if you put that plant in a dark area, it clearly would die and not, uh, not flourish. The great architect Frank Lloyd Wright was so captured and so just enraptured by light that his design, some of his greatest designs, and this is one, is, was designed on the principle of bringing the outside, bringing the light, inside. And so if you, as an architectural fan, would look and see a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's designs, you will see something 
along this line. Certainly everyone has a has the Thomas Kincaid as one of their favorite artists, and here's a couple of uh, just his painting. In fact, he dubbed himself the painter of light, and just classic, classic uh, paintings. I, in fact, it would, how cool would it have been for Frank Lloyd Wright and Thomas Kincaid to somehow uh, get together and work together? Would have been uh, would have been quite something, right? So, what is it? that captures our attention about light, even our imagination. I think it's important to be able to do this, to go back, step back, and actually look at some of the first, in fact, the original and initial reference to light. If you look at uh, the first verse here, the first couple of verses of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Just think about that for me. Form, without form, without void. In other words, there was nothing. This is about all that I can do with the idea of darkness, the idea of nothing. This is pretty much it. So the Spirit of God was hovering over Nothing. And then God says in verse 3 of Genesis 1, let there be light. And there was light. He spoke into the nothing. Now, think about that. And in this, as you look at these first few verses here in day one of creation, there was no reference made to the sun being created or the moon on day one, it says he created the heavens and the earth. And then we go on and he talks about the darkness, as I've mentioned. So here we are with this concept of nothing. And we have God speaking into the nothing. What are we to do with that? And trying to wrap our brain around it. Well, nothing, if you think about it or go and do a search on what is nothing, it's certainly the absence of something by, very, by the very definition. It, it, to not have nothing, we have to have the absence of something. And I don't want to get too wrapped up in this, but there's actually a philosophy out there, and you can once again Google this. It's called the philosophy of nothingness. Now, this is not a new philosophy. This has been around for centuries, and people have wrestled and struggled with this idea of what is nothing. And so we wrestle with this. And in fact, one of my favorite uh, TV shows in the uh, early, um, late 80s and early throughout the 90s was a show called Seinfeld. And I don't have a slide for that, but one of my, just love the show, but the moniker on the show, some of you may remember, was this is a show about nothing one of the funniest sitcoms of all time. But this idea of nothing is not, as I mentioned, a new idea. The great theologian and philosopher Augustine wrestled with this in the late uh, fourth century and into the early part of the fifth century. And he came up with a concept or with a label called the divine fiat. And some refer, using a Latin term ex nihilo, meaning something out of nothing. There was actually a song when I was growing up back in the early 70s, and I think it was Billy Preston, and he would sing this little jingle, nothing from nothing leaves nothing. You got to have something if you want to be with me. And it's one of those little things that just kind of sticks with you. But this concept of nothing has been around, or this struggle with nothing for quite a while. So Augustine struggled with this centuries ago. And in recent years, actually, the theologian R.C. Sproul attempts to wrestle with this a bit as well in his epic classic book, The Holiness of God, which I strongly, strongly recommend if you've not read it. And even if you have read it, read it again. It is just an epic, epic uh, 
expound, expounding on this idea of what it means to be holy, but what it means to start with nothing and be in God speaking into the nothing. So I can't get much beyond that. I'd tell you to take a couple of aspirin, but I can't unpack this, unpack that concept much beyond that. And the thing that Augustine and even uh, Sproul wrestle with is this idea that there was nothing, and our, the best our minds could do is the slide I had up there with just a, a blank or just a black um, screen, just this concept of darkness, that's the best we can do with it. But they both concluded, and I conclude, that even the nothing had to be something. So our minds are not even able to process this concept of nothing. I want to show you something here, just, uh, just uh, something to... One of those little fun facts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Well, the very last verse in all of Scripture, Revelation 22.21, says, The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. And what's so interesting about that is the idea that in, amen. And amen is another reference to Christ. And so what we get is at the beginning of God's word, in, at the end, amen, together, in Christ, alpha, omega. I think it's just an amazing declaration there. So that's just a little backdrop. I didn't want to take us too far off track. And as I used to say on TV shows when I was growing up, now back to our regularly scheduled program. So John eight twelve. Let's get there. And I read that a few moments ago. I want to unpack this part of Jesus' I am's with three primary points. And you, some of you have heard PPP throughout the um, last few months and few weeks with uh, everything that's been going on in our economy. So I've decided to kind of follow that path of PPP in my selection of points here. The first is the place. We'll talk about where Jesus makes this declaration. The second is the pronouncement, what he actually says and what he not only says, but what he means. And then thirdly, the punishment, what happens for unbelief. And then I'll provide a, hopefully a brief word, a brief uh, application. So first, the place. We jump to actually the 20th verse of chapter 8. So we jump ahead a little bit, but I think it's important that we start there. And Jesus actually, or John, actually tells us exactly where this proclamation is made. And he says in verse 20, These words he spoke, he being Jesus, in the treasury as he taught in the temple. What difference does that make? Well, I think it makes a big difference because this event that takes place in this temple, that takes place in Jerusalem, technically Israel, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't, Israel sits in Asia. But what's interesting about where it sits is really in the crossroads of Asia, Europe, and even Africa. The world's primary religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, actually collide in this area like nowhere else in the world. And it's still like that today. And it's been like that for uh, 2,000 years now. Jerusalem has more than 70 names throughout history. Some of the more famous or popular names were Holy City, uh, City of David. And one day the Bible tells us there actually be a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth. So starting with the place, I just want to show you a quick picture here. So this is the temple, and there's a lot going on here. This place is amazing. It's really the second temple. It's called Herod's Temple, and there's a lot been written about it. The Jewish historian Josephus gave us a lot of details, and even a Roman historian. Tacitus gives us a lot of detail, and I won't take the time to go through all of this, but needless 
to say it is a busy place. If they didn't have Chase's uh, crowd uh, uh, counter uh, la- that he talked about last week, but they estimate that on a given day there were certainly uh, multiples of thousands of people coming in and out of this temple. And as things progressed towards the uh, feast of the Passover, some estimated that the crowd sizes could have approached anywhere in the 80 to almost 100,000 at different times and at different years. The only parallel that I can make in modern day that I've experienced anyway is something akin to Times Square in New York City. You have some of everything, everything that there is to encounter almost in the world, you can find it at Times Square in New York City. Church, you can find business and commerce going on there. There's pretty much everything that you can think of as being there. Jesus was not a stranger to the temple. In fact, Jesus spent quite a bit of his time, both as a child and as an adult, in this place. In fact, Luke 2.22 tells us his parents actually brought Jesus to the temple 40 days after he was born. Now, part of that was a ritual cleansing that would take place, a ritual purification. And then 12 years later, you would recall his parents are there once again for this annual uh, pilgrimage to the temple, and they forget Jesus. Jesus is left. I, I don't know how that happened. If, you're, if you've been a parent for any amount of time, if it hasn't happened, um, it, it probably will. And so his parents leave Jesus. They're, you remember the story. They're a little frustrated with him. And he, they find him a few days later. And he says, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business in my father's house? And so the temple was not a place that was a strange place for Jesus. He was very familiar with it. In fact, in the early part of chapter 8, Jesus is in the temple early that morning, and you remember the Pharisees and the scribes bring the woman caught in adultery in the temple courtyard. So this is an area that he was absolutely familiar with. There's a number of parts. There's the Gentile courtyard. There's Uh, Solomon's portico here, and there's a number of references. Jesus was actually, where this takes place, would have been right in here in this area that was adjacent to the Holy of Holies, but it was called the Women's Court. And it probably would have been the the most crowded area where people were really packed in because they let women in that area. They didn't let women in throughout all the areas. They even had... Uh, some accounts, they even had an area, a barber shop in here where the Nazarites would get their hair cut. And, and they had places for the unclean, for those that were suffer, suffering from leprosy. And just a, it, it, was, it, it covered the gamut of life during this time. In fact, the lady who had, you remember the widow who put the two, her last two coins in the treasury Jesus was sitting there watching her and admiring her faith. So that's the place. The place is important because it attracted all of these people. And if you want an audience, if you want someone to come and hear a story and have the masses hear it, there was no better place to do it. So where or the location, the place was absolutely important. Now I want to move to the second P, and that's the pronouncement. The, the pronouncement is as we've hinged our, the title, our message here, I am the light of the world. Jesus makes this declaration boldly. I mean, he, he wasn't meek or shy about it, and he spoke right to those Pharisees that were challenging. In fact, in verse uh, 13, they push back. He says, I am the light of the world, in verse 13, they call him a liar. You're lying. Now, they knew exactly what he was claiming to do and claiming to be. And then he goes through this discourse with them. 
Now these are learned men who knew the Old Testament at that time. They knew all of the history that they had been taught and they were bound by the law. So Jesus is identifying himself and he even uses this term, I am the light. And Chase used this term last week, the tetragrammaton. I'll give that a $10 value on that big word. And Jesus is essentially describing himself as both God and Messiah. He dispels the darkness of unbelief and the darkness of sin and death. And throughout scripture, we see this. We see the psalmist in Psalm 27 declaring, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Great song, by the way. And then in 1 John 1, 5, it says, God is light and in him there is no darkness. These experts, these Pharisees, these scribes knew exactly what Jesus was saying. But Jesus, as I'll call him the goat of apologists, the greatest of all time, to, to literally describe who he is, no one could do it better than him, he seizes on their resistance. They're pushing back. They're basically saying, um, you're not who you say you are. And I can almost, almost hear the famous law and order chime that goes in in a courtroom with an exchange that I love to watch this show and love to hear that, wait for that. Da -da. So. so they're calling him a liar. And they're calling him a liar not because of what he said, but during this period of time, the law at that time said that you needed two witnesses. You needed two people to confirm or affirm what you were saying. And if you could find two, then you were fine. And they were challenging him on the idea that it was just him saying this. And Jesus, in such an eloquent and powerful way, basically says, no, it's not only me that's making this declaration, it's also my father. And in verse 18, he says, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the father who sent me bears witness about me. And then they go on in verse 19, who's... Well, where is your daddy? Or they said father. But where, where, is your, where is your daddy? Jesus responds, you don't know me. You don't know my father. Why? Because if you knew me, then you would know my father. Once again, making this absolutely affirmative, emphatic declaration of his deity and who he is, his authority. We live in a world that requires identification and identifiers. We need a driver's license to travel around. And we need that to be able to prove our date of birth and where we live and essentially telling the world, this is who I am, this is my resume, this is my pedigree, where we set up on Facebook and LinkedIn and all other social media outlets, basically telling the world, this is who I am. When I was facing a, a life-threatening surgery a few years ago, the surgeon came in prior to the procedure and he introduces himself and I had already gone through and done some, some uh, homework. You know, who is this rascal that's going to be doing this really extensive and invasive procedure? And he introduces himself and, and, he, and he goes through and he gives me sort of some of his background, which I had already researched. But then I asked him a question. I said, well, how many times have you actually performed this procedure? He said, oh, I've lost track, but it's probably somewhere in the 24 to 2500 range. That's all I needed to hear. I knew that the Lord had sent an amazing set of hands. So he had identified his authority. Well, Jesus is basically doing the, say, the same thing. He is essentially telling those Pharisees, and he's telling us that I am the great Savior. I am the light of the world. Now, I know it's not proper English, but he's just basically saying, he just, he just am. He just am. 
The darkness of death trembles and has been defeated by the light. So we have the place, the temple. We have the pronouncement that I am the light. And that finally takes us to the punishment. Well, what happens if we don't believe in this? What happens if it, it's just, for some of us, it's just a made-up story? It's just a feel-good story. It makes us, gives us the ability to cope with life and things like that. Jesus tells them in verse 21 of chapter 8, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. In verse 22, John now describes the crowd as Jews. And I'm not totally sure what to make of this because earlier he had described them as Pharisees, as scribes, and now he calls them Jews. The best thing I can do with this is basically I think that the crowd has grown and so as John is taking this all in it had to be more than just those Pharisees that had been identified but now it's a bigger crowd of Jews and so he labels them the Jews once again the crowd had grown and the audience was significant so they continue to mock him they're using sarcasm They go back and forth. Jesus stays on point. And this is something for us to remember when we're, not only as we live our life, but as we are sharing about him, stay on point. And Jesus says some interesting things about belief. And if you recall, back in Mark 5 and again in Luke 8, he's talking to Jairus, whose daughter is about to die. And Jesus essentially says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Just, just believe. But unfortunately, as one theologian puts it like this, unbelief will never have enough evidence. Unbelief will never have enough evidence. You just, if you're going to be stubborn, you just won't be able to believe. In fact, Paul tells us in Romans 1, if we don't believe with all the evidence that has been provided for us, At some point, there will come a time when we won't even have the ability to believe. You truly reach a place of no return. So in closing, as I wind down here and I try to take us in for a landing, I want us to think about something. 2020 was supposed to be this year of vision. I remember back in the spring or back in last fall, all these... um, catchphrases, 2020, it's going to be the year of breakthrough, it's going to be the year of great vision, and all these great things are going to happen. I don't know about you, 2020 has been uh, anything but that. In fact, it's been downright unclear of where we're going and the direction we're going. But I'm a big fan of inspirational quotes. In fact, if you come out and visit our uh, company, you would uh, see different quotes, and we have quotes all over our uh, banners hanging around our our plant. We have coaches like Vince Lombardi and some of the things they said to get their their, uh, teams fired up. Coach John Wooden of UCLA. We even have Maya Angelou and some of the amazing poetry that she gave us. But there's one quote that is also hanging on our wall, and And this is it. This is Thomas Edison, and most of you would give Thomas Edison the credit for creating the light bulb. We can now go to the wall, hit uh, a little lever, and boom, we we have light. One of his assistants, they were commiserating one day, and the assistant said, Oh, Mr. Edison, I just feel so bad. You've been trying, you've been trying, you've been trying and you haven't gotten it, you, I, do you think you can get there? He gets there, and he gives this powerful declaration. Now, I don't know if it's true that it was 10,000, or I've seen it different ways, but I like the fact that it was a lot. He says, I've not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. What's the so what of that? The so what is if you go searching for various religions around the world, I submit to you, and if you once again go to our friend Google, you'll find that there are thousands of religions. And people today are making thousands of attempts to try to get through, try to figure out, try to deal with this thing 
called life and this despair and this emptiness and this void, this God-shaped void that Pascal describes it as, trying to deal with this issue of darkness, trying to find the missing filament that Edison was so aggressive in his efforts to try and discover. There's all these different denominations, cults, and all these derivatives of the truth. And I just want to tell you, if you're on this treadmill trying to figure out, well, I'll just keep sorting through, I'll just keep trying to figure it. I'll take 10,000 effort or attempts if needed to try to figure it out. And I'll get there. That's the perseverance. I'll get there. I employ you, don't take, don't, don't take two. Don't take one. Just do as Jesus has said to us. Just believe. So a quick recap, and then we'll be ready. We've got the place we talked about. It was in the temple, how valuable and important that was. The pronouncement, what he said, I am the light of the world, and then the punishment, what happens if you choose not to believe. I want to finish up here with, with a quote from C.S. Lewis. You have to have a C.S. Lewis quote, right? And he says, and I really, really like this about the idea of sight. He says, and with this, I close. He said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun, sun, S-U-N, has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. In other words, when the scales of unbelief fall off our eyes, we're able now to see the sun, S-O-N, Jesus being the son, our worldview is much clearer and Jesus becomes the focal point and actually the center of everything. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for being the light. We thank you for shining into the darkness. And I ask, Lord, if there's anybody here or anyone listening to this, that is still in darkness. Father, I pray that you would illumine their eyes, illumine their hearts, and give them that special miracle that we've all experienced once we come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And I pray this in the mighty, mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.